Good morning, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, operative. Oops, it's just like frozen. Operative management of uh, humeral shaft fractures. Objectives of today's talk uh, to kind of outline non operative management strategies for humeral shaft fractures, discuss the indications for operative management of humeral shaft fractures. Uh, to discuss the use of IM nail versus RAF in the management of humeral shaft fractures, discuss management of radial nerve uh, palsies, and to discuss uh, the management of humeral shaft uh, non-union. Uh, start off with a few case presentations we have. Um, first is RS. RS is a 52-year-old male status post fall with a left humeral shaft fracture that had been sustained uh, six weeks ago and following up in the office, but was found to have uh, little evidence of healing, gross motion at the fracture site. Uh, past medical history is significant for, uh, for diabetes, uh, which is poorly controlled, history of smoking, uh, quit six, uh, six months ago. Um, uh, physical examination, uh, skin was intact. There was gross motion at the fracture site at six weeks. Uh, they had a positive motor and positive sensation in all distributions and they had a brisk capillary refill, good uh, radial pulses. Uh, here are uh, some, some injury films after uh, application of, uh, of splint here. You can see that there's a little bit of opposition um, and some, some, some angulation. Uh, here's uh, six weeks uh, post injury films. You can see some, some non bridging uh, callus formation um, in this x ray. Our next patient is PE, 64-year-old uh, female, uh, status post MVC versus drunk driver who sustained a right calcaneus fracture, uh, left humeral shaft fracture, uh, T12 chance fracture. A patient was driving on the turnpike when she was struck by a vehicle, causing her car to uh, roll over. Uh, she has no real significant past medical or surgical history. On examination, she has some tenderness about patient of the thoracic spine. Uh, she has a deformity of the humeral shaft, which is uh, pretty obvious swelling. The skin was intact though, and at the time of the injury, she was neurovascularly intact. Uh, we have these injury films. Um, anyone want to describe the films, uh, Jason? And uh, a little bit of angulation here. So there's a little apex anterior angulation. Uh, she was initially treated in a coaptation splint while the rest of her injuries were uh, stabilized. Next patient's PE, an 82-year-old female with a left proximal humeral shaft fracture. The patient was uh, mopping the floors in her home when she sustained a slip and fall on her left side. Note she uses the left upper extremity pretty, uh, uh, pretty consistently for ambulation with a uh, walking stick. Uh, she has pretty extensive past medical history, though, COPD, CAD, chronic low back pain, uh, osteoporosis. On exam, her skin was intact. She was neurovascularly intact. Uh, here are some, some injury films here for her. A uh, little background. Uh, shaft of the humerus defined as the area between the superior border of the pec major insertion and the area immediately above the supracondylar ridge. Uh, fractures are it's like a bimodal distribution, kind of like, like most fractures, high energy mechanisms in younger patients and lower energy mechanisms in the elderly osteoporotic patients. Uh, they're pretty, pretty uncommon, three to 5% of all fractures. Traditionally, all of these have been managed non-operatively. We don't really talk about operative management of humeral shaft fractures too, too much. Um, uh, radial nerve palsy is an associated condition that I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, later in this talk. Um, how to manage that, and uh, non-unions of the humeral shaft after non-op management can occur. You know, some studies say 20 to 30 percent of the time. Some say much less than that. So, you know, ORIF and IM nail definitely come into play here. Uh, the only classification really is to know is the AO classification. Um, there's a simple wedge and complex fracture patterns, which can be further subclassified. It's bone one, zone two of that bone. Uh, non-operative management indications, it's almost always indicated uh, for these to be managed non-operatively initially, um, up to 95% of the time, uh, according to most studies. Um, 
Traditionally, the teaching is that you can accept a ton of angulation in these humeral shafts, 30 degrees in the coronal plane, uh, 20 degrees in, in, in the sagittal plane and three centimeters of shortening. Um, this is, you know, based off of, you know, kind of some, some old studies from like 1960. Uh, this, is, this is kind of the main study that, that, that looked at that and where these numbers originated. Uh, it was a retrospective cohort study out of Middlesex Hospital in London. They just looked at 87 patients that were treated with plaster coaptation splint and cuff and collar, most commonly. Um, here is uh, an example of you know, what they used to treat these. Um, and they, they concluded that uh, in this group, anterior bowing of 20 degrees or varus of 30 degrees was present before it became clinically obvious. Before it became clinically obvious. And even then, uh, the function of the limb was good. So they basically just qualitatively examined all of these uh, humeri uh, after they had uh, healed and, and determined that even, even the ones that had 30 degrees of coronal plane deformity and 20 degrees of, uh, of, uh, of apex anterior deformity, you know, all kind of looked normal and the function of the function of the elbow and shoulder were pretty much normal in these patients. Um, th this, is, this is kind of a description of uh, a description of you know the time to union in these patients in this initial study. Uh, you see, as you can see, uh, most of them most of them ended up healing. About ninety percent of them. Um, this is kind of basically the paper was full of images like this uh, that were used as uh, justification for these numbers. Uh, so methods of non-operative management. I'm sure like all of us in this room are familiar with with uh, humeral shaft fracture non-op management. Uh, it can be painful sometimes. Um, initially, uh, you wanna manage the patient uh, in, in one of a few ways. You can use a sling and swath. Um, it's an easy, easy, inexpensive technique, but you know, sometimes patients don't really tolerate it and they, they want more immobilization. Uh, cuff and collar is commonly used. Um, a coaptation splint is another one that we, we typically use. Um, Problems with that is loosens easily, slips downward, needs frequent adjustments, and the application of the coaptation splint itself can be very painful for the patient as well as the provider. Uh, <laughs> uh, hanging cast is another one that can be useful in cases uh, where there's a transverse fracture with some shortening, um, but it has to be monitored very closely as it can cause over distraction if you're if you're not you know following this up closely radiographically. <laughs> Uh, you know, here are just some images of these main ways how we manage these. Uh, so functional bracing is the next step. After seven to 10 days when the swelling goes down, uh, we proceed to uh, functional bracing. It was initially described by Sarmiento et al. in uh, 1977. Uh, you know, basically, the technique is that you immobilize for the seven to 10 days and then a prefabricated brace with two plastic sleeves that either fit medially and laterally or anteriorly and posteriorly are used and connected with a uh, Velcro strap. Uh, patients are also given a cuff and collar sometimes as well and instructed to move the elbow as uh, they see fit. Early pendulum exercises are, are initiated and uh, regular radiographic evaluation is used. Uh, here's an example of a more modern uh, modern uh, Sarmiento brace. Uh, this is the original paper by Sarmiento that, that it started it all. Uh, it was a re retrospective review of 51 humeral shaft fractures treated non-operatively. Um, initially, they either got a hanging cast, a coaptation splint, or uh, they were even placed in traction sometimes. Um, the functional brace was applied as soon as the acute pain and swelling were had subsided. Um, they got this down to you know about a week, uh, sometimes even less than that. Um, uh, timing from injury to removal of the brace ranged from as low as three weeks, which seems pretty quick, to 22 and a half weeks, with a median of uh, eight and a half weeks. Uh, they only had one uh, non-union in the entire cohort, and it, it happened to be uh, a patient that had a, a pathologic fracture uh, secondary to metastatic carcinoma of the breast. Um, so they concluded that non-unions haven't even been really encountered in non-pathologic fractures. So this is a pretty good method to treat these. Uh, here's yeah, kind of the, the original, the, the original Sarmiento brace. 
there's also some more modern studies uh, that, that, that look at functional bracing for, for humeral shaft fractures. And, you know, their results are a little less optimistic than Sarmiento's. Um, you know, this is one by Rutgers et al. that's, you know, pretty frequently uh, cited. It shows about a 90% union rate. Um, there was no, and, and, you know, good range of motion afterwards. They also associated non-union with proximal third fractures. Uh, some more studies, Westrick et al. in 2017 looked at their cohort of 296 patients, and they found that there was actually a 23.2% non-union rate in non-op. Uh, Harkin et al. in 2017 had a 33% non-union rate, which is the highest I could find. So non-operative management, first line for most fractures. Uh, management with coaptation splint, cuff and collar, hanging casts or sling is followed by application of Sarmiento brace uh, seven to 10 days later. You can get a very high rate of union and you know, very successful treatment with this. Although some, some more modern studies are a little bit li less optimistic about this. Um, so now on to the kind of meat of this uh, operative uh, management. So indications for operative management, you have your open fractures, your prominent polytraumas, floating elbow, vascular injury that requires repair, coexisting brachial plexus injuries also, uh, you know, sometimes cited as an indication because you have less muscular support around the humerus and, you know, a higher rate of non-union has been found with these. Um, unacceptable alignment, obviously, uh, non-union or malunion, and, uh, Bilateral uh, humeral shaft fractures is also a commonly cited indication. Uh, so, two main or two main types of, of operative management: you have humeral nails and humeral shaft plates. You know, typically, four point five millimeter uh, plates uh, are, are used as kind of the workhorse. Um, most studies and most authors uh, suggest either six to eight cortices on either side. Um, there's also this minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis, which is, which is one of the more um, modern techniques that's being used and studied. So open reduction internal fixation uh, indications, it's useful for very proximal or distal fragments in which, you know, a nail won't really suffice. It's, it's useful in comminuted fractures, long oblique fractures, non-union or malunion where you have to open up and, and bone graft. Hardware, like I said before, the 4.5 millimeter plates, the workhorse, um, 3.5 millimeter plates can sometimes be used for smaller patients, as well as you can use, you know, dual plating for, for you know, distal periarticular fractures. Uh, the approach, typically, uh, most authors are using an anterior lateral or a posterior approach. Um, Postoperatively, there's some thought that you can just use early weight bearing and range of motion uh, versus delayed weight bearing for these type of fractures. Um, approaches uh, for the humeral shaft fracture kind of depend on the location of the fracture. Um, most authors are using the anterior lateral approach for proximal two-thirds fracture and the posterior approach for, for more distal one-third fractures. Um, in either of the approaches, identification and protection of the radial nerve is, is uh, one of the keys. Uh, the anterior lateral approach is... Uh, utilizes the deltopec interval proximally, the inner nerve is plane between the radial and musculocutaneous nerves and the brachialis in the middle and an interval between the mobile wad and the biceps distally. Uh, the radial nerve must be identified and protected and the risk of, the, of radial nerve injury is particularly high when you're, when you're using the Hohmann retractor, retractor on the distal 40% uh, distal of the humerus. This is kind of just a Further description of the uh, anterior lateral approach. The incision extends from the biceps and mobile wad distally to the delta pec interval proximally. You get through the fascia and it's extended to the delta pec interval. Uh, biceps is brought medially and the, delta, and the uh, mobile wad is brought uh, laterally. The radial nerve is identified and the brachialis is exposed. And then you kind of split the brachialis in the lateral third uh, between the inter innervations a musculocutaneous nerve and the uh, radial nerve. The deltoid insertion, uh, the deltoid insertion uh, can be partially released sometimes as needed um, to access the proximal humerus and the radial nerve is uh, mobilized as needed. 
Uh, posterior uh, tricep splitting approach to the humeral shaft is one of the more common ones for, for more distal fractures. You, it's, a, it's a longitudinal incision running from the tip of the coronoid. It, um, the interval between the long and lateral heads of the triceps is developed. Uh, you, you note the radial nerve, release the lateral head as much as needed, um, and you release the medial head, and you can go proximally until the axillary nerve is, is found. Um, so after ORIF, uh, post-operative weight bearing was kind of a, an area of discussion early. Um, there's a 2000 study that, that talked about uh, weight bearing after, after uh, humeral shaft for ORIF. And you know, basically what they found is that, that there was no real difference in, in, in union rates between non-weight bearing and weight bearing is tolerated. Uh, there, was, there was one hardware failure in, in, in each group. So there, there was really no difference. Um, most of the times they use 4.5 DCP plates. Um, sometimes they use 3.5 plates, I guess, on smaller patients. Uh, humeral shaft intramedullary now, uh, antegrade are commonly used. They're useful for proximal and middle third humeral shaft fractures. Uh, common indications are more transverse fracture patterns, uh, polytraumas, uh, disadvantages, you know, as kind of we'll see a little bit later is that they're often associated with shoulder pain, uh, rotator cuff impingement, and uh, you can't really identify the nerve. So, you know, you can't, you, you can't visualize that. Uh, they also can only go down uh, to two centimeters proximal to the start of the olecranon fossa. Advantages being that it's, it's much more minimally invasive. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, plating versus intramedullary na nail. Uh, place versus nails, there's advantages, disadvantages to both. Like I said before, intramedullary nail is obviously less invasive, but there's no visualization of the radial nerve and they've been associated with shoulder pain. Uh, plates, uh, you can get a more anatomic reduction. You can visualize the radial nerve, but they're much more invasive. Uh, this is a 2007 uh, prospective uh, randomized trial of 47 patients undergoing internal fixation using either an IC or IM nail or a DCP plate. Um, you know, what they found is there's no real difference between uh, American shoulder and elbow surgeon score, which is kind of a, a scale which, which talks about, you know, the function and, and pain in the shoulder and elbow. Uh, there was, the average time to union was lower in intramedullary nail. There was a there was a similar overall union rate, though. Uh, there was a higher rate of infection when you opened up, uh, when, you, when you did an ORIF, which, which makes sense. Uh, There's a higher rate of shortening of the arm and restriction of shoulder movement due to impingement in the intramedullary nail, which, which also makes sense. Um, so, so they concluded that there were superior union times, lower risk of serious complications like infection in, in intramedullary nail, and there was no real difference in functional outcomes. This is kind of the results, results summarize of that study. Another study in 2000 uh, by Chapman et al. Uh, it was a uh, prospective study, 84 patients, 38 undergoing nail, 46 undergoing uh, compression plating, um, basically found no, no difference in, in the union rate. Um, there was more shoulder pain and lack of shoulder uh, range of motion in the nail group. Uh, there was worse elbow range of motion in the plate group, especially for the more distal fractures. Uh, and other complications were, were pretty similar in, in both treatment groups. Another, uh, another study in 2000, uh, prospective randomized trial of 44 patients, uh, showed no significant differences in the function of the shoulder and elbow, the visual analog score, range of motion uh, at that six month point. Uh, the DCP group developed uh, three complications versus 13 in the intramedullary nail comp, uh, group, which they found to be significant. Uh, the sec there was a lot of secondary surgery on the intramedullary nail group, uh, mostly for, for pain to shoulder, uh, pain with shoulder range of motion, and a lot of times that was uh, reversible with removal of the nail. This is just kind of a meta-analysis that, that summarizes most of the studies. There were, there were three studies involving 155 patients that were pooled. Uh, plate fixation led to a lower risk of reoperation as well as a lower risk of, of shoulder pain postoperatively. 
and but there were there were there were limitations in the you know all these studies are pretty small 44 patients in, in one of the studies and 45 in another another more more modern systematic review says the best Best available evidence suggests that the differences between intramedullary nail and plate fixation were not significant in fracture union, radial nerve injury, and infection, but intramedullary nail significantly increased the risk of shoulder complications, impingement, and restriction of shoulder motion. So conclusion, controversy over whether or not to use uh, IM nail versus ORIF. Most studies show that there is increased shoulder pain and impingement after IM nail, which may be reversible with the, the removal of the nail. There's higher rates of reoperation after the intermedullary nail, which is typically due to, uh, to shoulder pain and removal of the nail. Uh, radial nerve injury, union rates, complications other than shoulder pain are similar in many studies. Um, there's obviously more research is needed in this field because you know, most of these studies are very small. There's also you know, a third option that, that, that's talked about more modernly, uh, minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. You basically just you achieve relative stability and secondary bone healing using a locked plate to bridge the fracture site. Um, typically, they're applied to the anterior humeral shafts through percutaneous incisions. Uh, this is a 2016 meta-analysis of MEPO versus conventional fixation techniques such as intramedullary nail and DCP. Uh, it was 391 patients. They found no significant difference between the MEPO and CFT in terms of operation time, fracture union rate, or time. Uh, MEPO had less radial nerve palsy than open reduction and, and higher adjacent joint function scores than I am now. So, you know, it was thought to, it's now thought to be a pretty good fixation technique and it's been found to be pretty safe. Uh, management of non-union. Um, a lot of these that we operate on are, are secondary to non-union. So it's it's kind of important to know uh, the facts about non-union of the, of the humeral shaft. Um, in the humeral shaft, it's a little bit different than, than, than other bones in the body. Uh, a non-union is considered greater than six weeks with no evidence of callus formation and gross motion at the fracture site. Uh, in other bones, it's, it's typically nine months with incomplete healing and three consecutive months uh, with no evidence of progressive healing. Um, these are the studies to kind of show why, why, this, why this is the case. Uh, this is a retrospective cohort study that looked at 84 patients um, treated non-operatively for humeral shaft fracture. Uh, they, they had 87% of their patients that healed their fracture within six months with non-operative management, uh, which is pretty consistent with other numbers that we see. Uh, they found that if the fracture was mobile clinically at six weeks, it was 82% sensitive and 99% specific for non-union. Only one patient with motion at six weeks went on to heal their fracture. So it had a 90% positive predictive value and a 97% negative predictive value. And it concluded, you know, basically that all patients should be tested for gross motion at their fracture site at six weeks is, you know, this is a pretty strong indicator that that patient may go on to, to non-union. Uh, what about radiographic parameters? Um, it, it, there was a 2021 study by Decker et al that looked at radiographic parameters, specifically the uh, rush use score, as well as gross mobility at the fracture site to predict non-union. Um, so this rush use score uh, basically is calculated by looking at all four cortices and, and qualifying the calluses either uh, none, non-bridging or bridging, and scoring them either one, two, or three, and then adding up all the scores. It's so basically at six weeks, if the score is less than or equal to seven, um, the patients were 15 times more likely to go on to non-union. So this is another indicator that, you know, you're, you're, you're headed towards the non-union. If you look at their numbers here, um, with rush use scores greater than or equal to uh, eight, uh, they had 55 unions and 14 non-unions, but if they were less than seven, five unions and, and 18 non-unions. Uh, fracture mobility also was a similar story. You know, if the fracture was mobile, they had, you know, double the amount of, 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 of uh, non-unions as unions. Uh, just recently, uh, last month, there was, there was a review article out of uh, JOS that uh, looked at the management of non-unions. Um, basically, their, their overall recommendations that 
kind of follow the studies that I just cited. You know, if, if you have uh, if you have radiographic evidence of non-union at six weeks um, and clinical motion at the fracture site, uh, they they offered their patients uh, surgery and kind of counseled them on exactly what those two findings mean. Um, they also kind of talked about meta metabolic abnormalities um, and, and kind of working those up. Uh, those should all be addressed prior to surgery, including things like uncontrolled diabetes, smoking, malnutrition, and metabolic uh, deficiencies. Their common metabolic workup was vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus, uh, parathyroid hormone, thyroid panels, BUN, and creatinine. Um, they, they then went on to talk a little bit about, you know, their management of hypertrophic versus atrophic non-unions and, and how atrophic non-unions require uh, biologic enhancements and uh, hypertrophic non-unions kind of need stability. Uh, this, is, this is another study that kind of drives that point home. It's a case series of 37 uh, patients that had unexplained non-unions, basically any fracture that was treated with adequate reduction and stabilization that went on to a non-union. They looked at all these patients, they did a metabolic workup and found that, you know, most of these patients, 31 out of 37 had a metabolic finding, most commonly vitamin D deficiency. And then if they, if they, if they fix this metabolic uh, abnormality, eight of 37 went on to achieve union just with that metabolic workup alone. And they concluded that all non-union should be worked up prior to operative intervention. So in summary, you know, radiographic evidence, a rush of less than or equal to seven combined with gross mobility at the fracture site at six weeks is very, very predictive of uh, non-union. Metabolic and endocrine workups uh, should, should, be, should be worked up prior to any surgical fixation. Uh, it's reasonable to offer operative intervention to patients to show radiographic and clinical evidence of non-union at six weeks. And they, they, kind of be, they have to be counseled on exactly you know, what this means. Uh, radial nerve palsy uh, is another you know, pretty common topic uh, with humeral shaft fractures. It occurs pretty commonly. It's 10 to 12% of the time after humeral shaft fractures is, is what the common no number cited is. Uh, Holstein and Lewis um, in 1963 described a type of fracture that, um, that was very associated with radial nerve palsy. And basically what it is is a distal one-third humeral shaft fracture, spiral fracture, where the spike is medially so that the radial nerve can kind of fall into that fracture site. Um, radial nerve palsies can be either, either primary from the injury or secondary after intervention. And they're kind of managed differently based off of exactly what type of uh, nerve palsy that you have. Uh, there's controversy on, on whether or not to explore and when to explore these injuries. Um, most of these actually do end up uh, recovering with, with simple observation. Uh, here's just a picture of exactly what that Holstein-Lewis fracture is. It's the spike is is medial. Uh, so so how should we manage these radial nerve palsies and humeral shaft fractures? There's there's a, a few different you know methods to manage these um, and indications for each of these methods. There's a watchful waiting. There's early exploration and kind of a later exploration. So expectant management, uh, primary nerve palsies have a, has a pretty high rate of recovery with no exploration at, at all. Uh, it's greater than 70% in most studies. Um, so, so just kind of waiting it out and, and, seeing, and, and seeing if you get a recovery is, is useful because a lot of them do start to recover at like that eight week point. <laughs> Um, in routine exploration of humeral shaft fractures with radial nerve injuries early on, only 12 were, were found to have injuries that were a result of transection and, and needed to be repaired. So, you know, waiting saves you a lot of unnecessary surgery, and it's, the, it's really the recommendation now for, for um, primary, primary uh, radial nerve palsies. Early exploration, um, there's, you know, a few, few indications for this. Um, obviously like your open fractures with penetrating trauma, uh, vascular injury, uh, secondary palsy sometimes after, after closed reduction is argued, um, severe soft tissue injury. Uh, and there's many arguments for why it should be done right away. Um, the first is that the fixation at the time of exploration can, can, uh, 
can protect the nerve further. Uh, early repair can lead to less tension in the repair. It's technically easier to, to, to explore shortly after the injury. Uh, that's because there's you know, less scar tissue, less callus formation, um, and there's you know, obviously less of a chance of entrapment in the callus. Uh, late exploration uh, is useful you know, in, only in, in cases which don't resolve on their own, obviously. Uh, it, it avoids unnecessary surgery in patients that may recover anyway. Um, most, certain, most palsies recover without intervention. Of those that don't, though, a lot of them are due to entrapment and laceration. Um, there's, poor, there's evidence that the results are much poorer uh, with, with later repair after five months. So mo most authors suggest that it's done prior to that. Uh, it's more ch technically challenging a lot of time due to callus formation and scarring. And re innervation of the end plates should occur by 12 to 18 months following the injury if it's going to work. So it, you, you have to be able to do it in a time frame where you can actually get recovery. Uh, nerve recovery, you know, commonly tested and talked about thing is kind of the order at which the nerve recovers. Uh, you, you first get the brachioradialis and radial wrist extensors recovering. Um, the extensor indices recovers last. Uh, the pattern occurs in most patients about three to four months after injury. So with a nerve palsy, a lot of people recommend an EMG starting at two months. This gives you a good baseline, um, and it can tell you if there's kind of signs of recovery on the EMG. Uh, four to six months seems to be a pretty good time for, for, for late repair based off of what most authors are saying because it gives the, gives the nerve a chance. If there's no, no sign of, of recovery at all, um, you know, things like tendon transfers may, may be indicated. Um, secondary palsies, um, they've been found to occur after about 6% of cases uh, after ORIF. Um, some authors are, are recommending immediate exploration. Some recommend a four to six month observation period. Um, overall, the rate is very good in secondary nerve palsies of which they recover. Um, it's pretty similar to primary nerve palsies. This is a paper that kind of looked at a lot of humeral shaft fractures, 151 that were treated surgically. They had a 6% rate of uh, secondary radial nerve palsy, and they, and they kind of wanted to describe you know, how, to, how to manage these. Um, so in five out of nine of these, uh, of these humeral shaft fractures with radial nerve palsies after ORIF, the radial nerve hadn't been identified. Uh, in four out of nine, the radial nerve was identified. Um, so, so the five that, that they couldn't find the radial nerve during the operation, they, they went on to explore. And in all five of those, they, they found that there was a kind of a mechanical explanation for why they had this radial nerve palsy. Um, the four out of nine that, weren't, that were all identified during the operation, they didn't explore and all of those made a full recovery. So they recommended uh, early exploration if the nerve was not identified intra-op. <laughs> And here's kind of what they what they saw. You know, one one of the nerves was was hit by an external fixator bolt. Uh, one was compressed by bone uh, a bone fragment. One was irritated by the plate. One was compressed under the plate. So, in summary of of radial nerve palsies, um, primary nerve palsies usually recover, and most people manage these expectantly. Studies show an 87% rate of recovery and only a low number of these palsies have uh, any sort of reparable damage. So, you know, it saves a lot of operations to not, you know, act on these immediately. EMGs should be obtained at like the two month point. Uh, it's pretty commonly recommended um, to assess for the location of the lesion and to see, get a baseline and to see if there's any evidence of recovery on the EMG. Uh, secondary nerve palsies fall into two classes, those in which the nerve was and wasn't visualized in the uh, surgery. Uh, if the nerve wasn't visualized, a lot of authors will recommend that you, that you do an early exploration um, just to look for, for, for uh, reversible causes. So back to the, the case presentations. RS. Uh, the patient with the uh, humeral shaft uh, non-union at six weeks uh, underwent underwent in uh, an ORIF with a 4.5 millimeter GCP plate through the anterolateral approach. Post-op image is here, and then a two-month follow-up. He has uh, great evidence of callus formation, and he's he's doing awesome. Uh, all nerves are intact. <laughs> 
PE. Um, uh, the the, the, the uh, patient that was the polytrauma, um, she underwent ORAF with a 4.5 millimeter uh, DCP plate. Uh, Postoperatively, she was found to have a partial radial nerve palsy. Uh, her radial nerve sensory was intact. She did have a uh, uh, minimal uh, motor function in the radial nerve distribution. Um, she's about a month postoperatively uh, now, and um, you know, there's discussion about getting her an EMG. PE uh, underwent a humerus IM now, and uh, it's good evidence of callus formation in her most recent follow up. Conclusions uh, Most humeral shaft fractures can be managed non operatively initially. ORIF and intramedullary nail are viable options for the treatment of humeral shaft fractures. Um, IM nail obviously has, has higher rates of shoulder pain. Uh, MEPO is another technique that's becoming more common and more studied. Non unions in the humeral shaft are those in which you see no evidence of bridging callus and motion at the fracture site of, at greater than six weeks from the injury. Uh, radial nerve palsies are associated with humeral shaft fractures, and the exploration of these remains an area of controversy. So, any questions? Uh, I would say it's a, a very good review of everything, John. Uh, just on the couple of things. One, post-operative care, uh, non-operative care, I mean, is not a passive sort of thing where you just put someone in a splint and, or put them in a hanging arc or whatever and just or put them in a star mantle and let, let them go on their way. You need to tell these patients that they need to work on triceps and biceps co-contraction and they need to do it all the time. And by, by contracting your biceps and your triceps, you are stimulating motion at the fracture site and compression at the fracture site, especially for those transverse ones. Uh, if, you, if you just hang someone in a hanging arm cast or whatever, uh, and they're not active about it, I think that's going to increase your chance of, of not having a good result. Um, so that's number one. Number two, your, your slide on approaches. You mentioned that uh, uh, sort of plates are good for proximal and distal and not the middle, and nails are more for the middle. I'll tell you that surgeons are either, either they're platers or they're nailers, and they'll either nail every fracture or plate every fracture. There's no reason why you can't plate a mid-third fracture. And in regards to approaches, uh, the anterior lateral approach, you're really going to use it if you think you need to be extensile proximally. And that posterior approach, you're really going to use it if you think you need to be extensile distally. So that sort of just makes your decision there. In the middle, it's, it's dealer's choice in the middle. Uh, the posterior approach you showed is the triceps splitting, which is fine. There's never been any evidence that splitting the triceps causes any issues with regards to scarring or worse elbow function or anything like that. Uh, but I think most surgeons now are doing sort of the posterior lateral approach where you're not splitting the triceps. Uh, you know, that Gerwin paper, obviously, where you, you find the nerve and you just go through the lateral uh, aspect of the triceps and elevate everything immediately. And uh, that's a little bit more, in my mind, I just, I, I hate splitting the triceps and it's just, it's just, you're, you're going through all that muscle just, just for, for me personally, makes the visualization, visualization a lot harder. I like just getting the whole triceps out of the way. It makes things a lot easier. Um, and the issue with nailing, I think that a lot of people just kind of put a nail down and not really worry about it and not worry about the technique. As you know, you've done these with me. You, you put your guide wire in first. You're very delicate with the rotator cuff. You don't just ring through the cuff. Uh, and like I do with all my nails, you need to make sure that your length is okay. You can compress with the nail so you can lock it distally, back slap a little bit, or lock it proximally first with the humerus and forward hit it a little bit to get compression at the fracture site and then lock it distally. Uh, so those are just sort of the points on the whole thing. And finally, if it's my radial nerve, I probably explore it early because I do agree that exploring those things late is, is really, really difficult. And uh, on an x-ray, if you see a transverse fracture with distraction, that's probably one of those cases where the nerve is, is lacerated, not, not uh, just a palsy. So I, I would explore high energy transverse distraction injury. I'd explore that one early. John, you know what the advantage of the Sarmiento race was uh, supposed to be over coaptation splints or hanging casts? Yeah, so, so they're, they're, they're lighter. You, they allow for better elbow and shoulder range of motion. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like a piston effect. You know, when the muscles contract, it, it kind of straightens out the bone. His, uh, this was actually borrowed originally from his tibial uh, uh, Sarmiento braces which went on to be one of the larger causes of deformity after closed treatment of tibial fractures. But his theory was that by compressing all the soft tissues circumferentially, you got a volumetric alignment uh, and immobilization. Um, and so 
the more modern one that you showed included an extension that went up over uh, the shoulder over the deltoid. His didn't, uh, and it was added later because it wasn't really all that successful. Yeah, that, and that's the more commonly used Sarmiento brace, but it, go back to his original article, uh, it just stopped short. Um, brace theory didn't work out that well clinically. Uh, in any of the studies, uh, did anyone uh, discuss uh, bone stimulators, bone growth stimulators? Yeah, that wasn't, wasn't really discussed in many of the uh, non-union studies I looked at. I didn't really see too much discussion of bone stimulators. Uh, it was, was not really in that uh, most recent one that I recall. You know, it was uh, enjoyed a very, very brief uh, uh, period of time uh, early on with implantable uh, direct current bone growth stimulators. They worked, but it was an operative procedure. And the thought was, well, if you're going to operate, uh, plate, plate it. Sometimes they were added on uh, plating treatment for non-unions as an adjunct, especially the uh, hyper uh, the uh, atrophic, atrophic non-unions. Yeah. John, I'd, I'd like to say it was a nice talk, but I fell asleep two or three times along the way. I'm not sure I caught it all, but the um, oh, I want to echo a couple of things that um, that. Carlos said he he brings a lot of experience to to that and uh, and I've had, I've had very similar findings with some of the pearls that he mentioned. One of them, however, that um, and I don't know if Carlos has seen this or not, but when I I see a great number of problems with um, humeral shaft fractures not healing when there's a concaminate proximal humerus fracture. It's like that metaphyseal fracture proximally gets all the emphasis on healing and the shaft part of that will not heal. So, um, and I'm not just talking about accommodated mid shaft fracture. I'm talking about segmental. So there's a, there's two different areas that are trying to heal. They tend to be very spiral in nature, but, um, they, they are bad actors in my book. And I find that I end up having, a, you know, I wait and I wait, and I wait, and I have to end up fixing them anyway. Um, and the only other thing that I wanted to mention is the delayed nailing of these. Like if you waited a long time, you gave it like a really good effort, um, fixing them, um, nailing them, in a closed manner is very, very difficult, if not impossible. So you can still nail them, but you've got to nail them open. And in many cases, you've got to create a, you know, a new canal in the, uh, in the shaft with a, with, with a drill bit <laughs> or a curette or something so that you can, uh, you can bridge the nail across that. So open nailing, if it's, a, you know, a really old um, repair of a non-union. If you get there, you know, earlier on, you know, you're in the first four or six weeks, I think you can do a closed nailing. But beyond that, I think it's a little bit more difficult. Those are my two pieces. Good job. Thanks for the nap. You're welcome. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with, uh, I'd agree with Tim um, with that. And also the one thing you did not mention, John, is that paper from HealthFit when you, about uh, treating these non-unions, uh, that you treat them with plate fixation, with compression. Uh, you can use regular uh, allograft. You do not use need to use autograft, and his, un, his union rate was ninety eight percent either way. So whether you used autograft or just allograft, uh, he, used, he used like a he used to use this DBX sort of thing that looked like a piece of Wrigley chewing gum that you'd wrap around the non union site and then plate it, uh, and the results are equal. So th I think that's a pretty important paper that I, I, just for completely the sake, you know, in case you want to keep this paper for future things, I would definitely put that in in your talk. And I definitely find that in Ring's paper, he said that there's no association between these sort of larger ladies with big pendulous breasts with those proximal thirds. Every single humeral non-union I get referred to me is one of those ladies. <laughs> That's exactly right. So look That's, out for that. It's a lot of, lot, of, lot of patients that fracture their humerus seem to have those. <laughs> the, treatment is, <laughs> the treatment for that is, is open it up, plate compression, Compression, uh, you know, lag screws, and then a and then a compression plate. I think nailing a, a non-union is probably not a great idea. I'd have to yeah. agree with Carlos that I, I did a lot of nailing because those interlocking nails are invented when I was a fellow, and the ones, you know, the simple fractures heal, but the, the ones that are transverse and distracted, if you didn't compress them with a nail, they didn't heal. And I, and I think we learned the hard way that um, an open plating for non-union is far better than. Nailing. The one use that you didn't talk about in, in nailing is, is pathologic fractures or impending pathologic fractures. In most cases, it's minimally invasive. The patient gets back to their lifestyle and virtually all of them, the, the nailing outlives the patient. 
I think that's a good point. I, I just jump in here and say on those um, non-unions, you know, you can shorten the humerus and they're, you know, they're not walking on their hands. So you can go ahead and compress the surfaces and increase the chance of healing. Um, so you want to get good ends and you can kind of match them up. Sometimes you put a Weber clamp on either side and get good compression before you lay your plate on there. You know, I will say that, and then maybe it was just my bad luck, but some of these that get sent to me late, especially in the distal third, where I have to take down the non-union and plate them, I've had a very high incidence of irritating the radial nerve afterwards. So that's kind of made me think about how I treat these initially when I get one. If I think it's gonna be a fracture that's going to have a high incidence of non-union, I may go in and just fix it now instead of watching, waiting, and then two or three months later having to go in, strip the radial nerve out and potentially cause a complication. Hey, yeah, John. There, there, the, the alternative to that is rings paper on distal humerus fractures says that, you know, they do better in a splint and there's a higher rate, rate of nerve palsy plating them early on. So, you know, it's, it's, it's issue of nerve injury either way, whether you do it early or late, that's the take home point. That's why if the, if the radial nerve was not on the humerus like it is, there'd be no controversies about humerus. Every single humerus would be plated or nailed and you wouldn't even have this, this conversation. It's the radial nerve that really makes, makes this bone uh, different from every other, other fracture that we treat. So John, Roger. yeah, uh, I stayed awake the entire time. I thought oh, that was a great picture. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Uh, um, Dr. Sahabian. Oh. Um, did you run across anything that looked at um, ultrasound, looking at the radial nerve early on to see whether you could tell whether there was a transection acutely? I, I, I did not uh, see those papers if, if they exist for ultrasound. Only, only real talk is... Uh, is uh, EMG, but yeah, I, I didn't see anything that kind of mentioned ultrasound. You know, I've never thought of doing that, actually. I, that's not a terrible, I mean, it, it should be a, an identifiable nerve on ultrasound, yeah. it should be, but uh, I've never done that. We have to try that. I've, I've seen uh, a paper about uh, the ulnar nerve, but uh, um, just thinking. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. I, I would think that, yeah, I think there was one paper with respect to ulnar nerve where the nerve is uh, snapping and, and, and uh, dislocates, relocates, and they were able to demonstrate that on ultrasound. But I would think we'd have to speak with the radiologist, but I would think we'd have a tough time uh, in an acute fracture uh, with uh, hematoma, uh, muscle disruption, uh, tracking the nerve after it once you get into the uh, fracture area, I, I don't know that they could make that distinction. It, maybe you could, I don't think it's something that they could make. You it'd have to be something that the surgeon would do, not the radiologist. I mean, you get you order an ultrasound from a radiology department, and you may as well be, you know, reading impressionistic art. Unless you're actually the person doing it, you're not going to be able to build that sort of three D map of where things are. So you have to find that nerve proximal or distal to where the fracture site is, and then track it and see if you can, you know, track it along past where the, where the fracture goes. That's a, that's a user dependent thing. You're not going to order that study and get a, a report that says it's intact or not. You have to do that yourself. Uh, um, I mean, I, forward, I can comment I anybody, to your paper. Anybody, can, let, you, can let, you guys hear me? Ross, Ross can come. We're here. So. Ross, go ahead. Yeah. So if it, I mean, just a comment on that. I, I have been asked a couple of times to track the radial nerve. I will say that well, you know, when you're looking at the spiral groove, depending on the size of the patient, it can be very difficult sometimes, at least in my experience, to see some segments of it. You know, usually what I end up doing is I start at the elbow and work my way up, and I see as far as I can track it proximally. Then I go up to the sort of the armpit from the brachial plexus and track it down and hope that I kind of meet so that I know I've covered everything. Um, it's not easy to do. I agree with the comment that was just made, as, you know, in the, in the setting of a recent injury when you're dealing with hematoma and potentially fracture fragments and things like that, that's just going to make it even that much harder. And it's going to be hard to communicate well between the, as somebody else just said, between the radiologist and the surgeon, where exactly the problem is happening, unless you're, you know, marking the skin or something to give a general sense. So, uh, you know, it can be done. You can definitely track the nerve with ultrasound, but I think there's a certain dependency 
obviously on the skill level of the radiologist, the size of the patient, and then trauma is going to be a big complicating factor. Well, it might be the topic for a, a paper. Uh, whenever you're thinking about opening these, <clears throat> try and uh, do an ultrasound at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I would just grab all the residents, put them in a room, try and find normal nerves and how well and how easy it is to track on a normal arm. And then you'll have something to compare with when you have the pathology in front of you. And I think you're going to either need to do that with the radiologist next to you or, you know, learn how to do it and do it independently. I think either way is okay. To do that right, you'd have to fracture half the residents. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not suggesting breaking anybody's arms except John's. <laughs> uh, Dr. Sahabian mentioned earlier that it's much easier to explore these acutely versus uh, later on. I also wonder just if you don't explore them until three months later, how much healing potential you leave on the lose on the nerves if you do have to repair something, you know, for, at zero days versus three months. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. You know, you, you can mobilize the nerve fairly significantly. Um, and be in most cases, be able to get fresh ends for a primary repair of that nerve. But, um, and, and I think somebody mentioned, you know, you can shorten the, the humeral shaft a little bit as well. And I think, you know, I'd, I would personally rather do that than trying to put some sort of interposition, you know, nerve graft in there. If I, if I, you know, if I, if I could avoid that. So some of the, you know, the more bigger blast injuries, if you will, or bigger zone of injury to the nerve, I think you're stuck with cable grafting of some sort, but uh, I try and do primary neurophy when I can. And and yeah, you're right though. The earlier you get in there, the easier it is to do because the nerve, you know, it kind of retracts on itself and it springs backwards, and it's it, it's it, it's harder to fix for sure. The, the longer you wait, you have to have a fairly high index of suspicion when somebody's nerve is just just dead out and it hadn't been manipulated, and you know, it's not like uh, you know. Your, your, your gut's telling you it's not transient. You, you should go and look at it. You know, so, I, I so the, best, the best paper on that is, is Ossophilius did it in 2020. And it's a review from like the 1960s all the way through current. And they found a much higher incidence of recovery of the radial nerve if you did it early. Now, those numbers are somewhere around 90% if you do it early. And if you do it late, it's somewhere below 70%. If you just watch it, it's about 77%. So you could say, hey, some of those people, you know, would, would have gotten better if you just gave them time anyway. The thing in my mind is when you can really intervene as if that nerve is interposed in the fracture, or maybe sometimes it's kind of draped right over a spike and you can just move it over and it can recover. If that nerve is lacerated and you're going to either do a graft or a primary repair, you know, chances